Hello, everyone, and welcome to this second Capella webinar of 2022. I'm thrilled to introduce Tony Kama. Tony has been practicing and supporting systems engineering for over 35 years now. He's currently a key contributor to the development and deployment of MBSC products for Siemens Digital Industry Software. And today he's going to talk about the modeling of systems of systems. Tony, the stage is yours. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to, to, to give this presentation. Um, my personal background with Capella, I've gotten, I got started in 2017 and I was basically introduced to this. Uh, shortly after that, I started building some models of my own um, and that's kind of how I got started doing this. Uh, and this system of systems topic has popped up quite a bit over the years as I've been working on this and I've kind of developed some techniques for it. Um, some other things that happened along the way, uh, I work for Siemens and we developed a partnership with OBO and we produce a product called System Modeling Workbench. Um, one of the turning points around uh, my uh, really getting engaged with uh, uh, with Capel was actually mentoring middle school students and getting engaged with them and using it. Uh, we actually won, uh, they actually, the, the team actually won a PA state competition uh, and we started by using Capella models uh, for that. And so that really made me feel that this is a product that, you know, has a lot of potential uh, for introducing at various levels of education. Uh, in August 2019, we actually also introduced it to the University of Michigan. Um, in 2020, uh, we've used it for a masterclass series uh, on the internet. Uh, you can look that up with Lunch with Larry. Uh, just to let you know, uh, it's of all the classes that were done in that series, uh, by far, MBSE is the highest one, the highest session with uh, over 8,000 views, uh, with the other ones not even coming close to that. Uh, I also did some presentations with Capella Day and uh, with CS, uh, CS, CSDSM. Um, uh, last year, I launched a YouTube channel, and I, I recognize some of the names from uh, that channel uh, and been abusing that to kind of walk through my example of the solar charger. Uh, I like to use my hobbies as ways to teach, uh, and that solar charger uh, uh, was uh, started out as a uh, as a little uh, you know project that I did at home, and it's quickly expanded into a training course. Uh, so, and it's been delivered in many different places now as an example of a of a Capella model and how it can lead to a product architecture. And then, uh, kind of the last thing that kind of happened recently is the University of Michigan was presenting uh, their experience with using Capella at the Nicosi uh, International Working Group. So it's been a fun ride over the last couple of years. I actually host a weekly meeting uh, with um, uh, Siemens staff where we discuss uh, the topic of uh, system of system modeling uh, in MBSE. Uh, so it's a great event. Uh, it started out with five people and we regularly now have, you know, 40 to 50 people that join that and and it's been a, a great experience. And, and I just really want to give back to the community and that's what this presentation is about. Okay, so I'm going to start with talking about uh, the system of system modeling by kind of giving a definition. And the definition I'm using is from the NCOSI uh, System of Systems Primer. Uh, it's a very good reference. Uh, gives, it's a very easy to read. Uh, it gives you an introduction to what systems of systems are. Uh, and in this particular example, it says that, you know, a system of system is a, is a collection of independent systems integrated into a larger system that delivers a unique set of capabilities. Uh, the independent constituent systems collaborate to produce this global behavior that they cannot produce alone. And so you're going to hear me use the term constituent systems uh, as I go through this model, uh, this presentation. Uh, one of the things that it talks about in this is, uh, and Capella can meet this need, is that constitu constituent systems uh, uh, make decisions or upgrades without considering the rest of the system of system. They don't play well together, in other words. So that's what makes it a, a system of systems as opposed to just a system of components. Um, the CS, I'll use CS just to save myself from trying to say the word constituent every time. Uh, the CS may withdraw possibly from the whole system of system without warning. Uh, the separate uh, CS are often drawn from different engineering disciplines, uh, so that makes it a little bit more challenging too. Uh, and then also testing and upgrading is very difficult, of course, because of the fact that you know things are uh, these constituent systems can change without basically playing along with what the system's need is. Um, 
with Capella, I feel that you can model a variety of these. You can go from a very strong uh, traditional definition, meets the definition of the system of system, as I show kind of on the right-hand side of this diagram, um, where you can do, like, let's say, a, a mission-level um, drone application. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through that example. But then at the same time, you can also do what I would say was it may be a weaker system of systems, where the constituent systems may, some of them may be, you know, it meet the definition of, of a constituent system, but other ones may just be components. And that's really kind of typical of an Internet of Things types of problems uh, where they're not, you're not completely uh, a true system of systems. So it kind of handles that. And, and what I used to, to kind of decide what was weak and strong is just by looking from, again, from the NCOSI handbook um, that, you know, uh, a system just ha has a very clear set of stakeholders. But when you get into a system of systems, you may have multiple levels of stakeholders. And if you kind of look through this list, uh, you know, clear objectives and purposes, clear management and structure, clear accountability, clear operational priorities, have a single life cycle. All these things different when you get into the system of systems mode, and sometimes they are, you know, what I call a weak system would be on this side of the, the the spectrum. But the strong ones, these are definitely more in the all in the right hand side of this table. And so what I did is, you know, coming through, kind of come up with this. I didn't want to lay out steps of doing systems because that seemed too formalized. Uh, so what I did is I kind of came up with a set of guidelines that to how basically how you think about the problem and how you should think about it. So this is my set of guidelines I've put together, and I'm actually going to walk through these both as mo that more traditional system of system model, but I'm also going to walk through it as an Internet of Things model. So, and so the first one, uh, and I'll I'm going to go through each one of these one at a time as I go through it, uh, and you know so I'll I won't I'll spare the time of walking through them all now, and I'll walk through them one at a time as we go through the example. Okay, first, a project has only one system. It becomes the system of the system of systems. And, and this is, you know, very compatible with the Arcadia methodology. I have here a picture that I pull, pulled from a, a Pascal's Rogue's presentation. Uh, it's a typical one that we've all seen many times if you're in Capella, where it basically talks about understanding the need and, and developing the solution. And what I want to emphasize here is that the system is the is the thing that you would have in that system analysis. So it is the boundary of the system. So that is the system of the system of systems. So that's what you would worry about. And in this particular example, uh, that system is the a, a disaster recovery system. So it's going to be located in that, and I'm going to identify, and, and that's going to be my system that I'm going to work with. Okay, now the next one is a project should focus on the the stakeholders for the system of systems. So that's that's another important part that you need is to think about the stakeholders. And in this particular instance, the actors and entities of that system are your stakeholders. Uh, and so that is focused here. I highlight the fact that this disaster recovery system has a, a host nation, a central command, on-site personnel, distressed, distressed uh, location. Those are the you know the stakeholders that are outside of it. Now, I use the word stakeholders as kind of a generalization for actors and entities. It makes it easier. You notice I'm now looking at, I'm still in the system analysis phase. So now I'm going to jump over to uh, the, the next screenshot. So the system may be composed of constituent systems and or components. And I use the word, I have the little wishy-washy and or components because, again, I'm trying to address this for building Internet of Things example also. And so in that case, now we actually move to the, the logical architecture and basically showing how the system basically would be built. So in this uh, sense, the, I'm using for the constituent systems, I'm going to be using the logical architecture and the physical architecture to, re to, to represent those. Notice that I'm not using operational analysis at all. Uh, I'm basically using the system analysis and the logical and physical architectures to represent uh, the system analysis to represent the system and the logical and physical to represent the systems or the constituent systems. This is kind of where I think it's it's important to do that. You still should continue using operational analysis, but it, again, it should be focused more on the operational analysis for that system that you're working on. So you're still going to keep the focus on all the actors. You don't want to put into the operational analysis all the the constituent systems if you if you can help. You really don't want to, you know, because they'll just end up being part of the bigger system. 
The other thing that's really important is that functional chains deliver the needs uh, of the stakeholders across the constituent systems and components. So this is built upon building upon the work of Stefan Bonnet, uh, Jean Luc, uh, and Juan Mavez. These are you know the, the, the standard uh, functional chain capabilities, but the difference here is that the system of system capability is the capability that you're talking about, and uh, the components that we're now talking about are really the the constituent systems. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to walk through an example of basically going from operational analysis to system analysis to logical architecture, kind of show, uh, take a little pause from going through the guidelines to kind of show uh, how that connection of that functional chain would work. So I'm going to go from this, uh, I'm going to do this disaster protection, I'm going to walk through and I'm going to show each one kind of the operational process, uh, and then I'm going to show the functional chains through the system analysis, logical and physical. First of all, we have this disaster recovery system, which is meant to basically go in and help uh, an area that has had a, a disaster. Uh, in, in this disaster recovery system, uh, we're going to be focusing on, in this particular example, uh, the performed drone recon. That's down here in the bottom. Um, this performed recon, and I'm, I'm going to take a, since my timing is good here, I'm going to take a quick shot. I'm going to go over, and I'm going to actually do this live. So I'm going to show you that, you know, for, we have the operational analysis. I'm going to bring that up. So here's the operational analysis view again. Uh, and you can see here in this view, we have, here's the disaster recovery system. Oh, this is the SAB, sorry. But here's kind of the operational analysis view. Here's the perform drone recon. It's the kind of the purple flow that's going through it. Uh, I have the host nation. Zoom in a little bit here. I have the host nation down here. I have central command. I have an unmanned uh, drone. I have a distressed location. And I show this flow of what I want to do. And in this case, you know, it's starting with social media, uh, basically getting information and, and then flowing through the central command, which then gives the uh, information to the unmanned drone at aircraft to basically do the flyover, capture photo, capture video, locate trap people. Uh, and then, and then that information from the distressed location, and then of course communicate that back to the the central command, and basically back to the host nation. So that's kind of the the system of systems view of the operational analysis. Next, I'm going to go into the system analysis. So now, I, in this mode here, I'm narrowing in on the performed recon, and I've basically now defined my system of my system of system. This is the disaster recovery system. And so I've shown the functionality that's being allocated to that system. In this case, it's being delivered by not only by the, you can see the performed drone recon, but I also have a UAS, an unmanned air vehicle system here that basically is also collecting data. I think that could be the small drone. Uh, and then, uh, and that's all part of the system. Also not shown here are some other things to do with uh, on the ground troops. Going back to the, Logical architecture. In this mode here now, I start to break the system up into the pieces. And so in this section, I've actually now broken up the recon drone from the, the unmanned air vehicle. And I've started doing this in this logical space of developing the, the system of system model. So now you can see I have the constituent systems kind of note, noted as logical architecture. And I am, again, showing the flow through the, the entire thing. Okay. Next, I go into the physical architecture. I have a very high level diagram and this high level diagram is, is a real diagram. It's, you know, typically you might see this and uh, some other methodologies. This would be a cartoon, but no, this is actual the actual model objects here. So if you do go into the semantic browser, for instance, you can actually sit on the central command and find out that it does have functions allocated to it. So it actually has all the different pieces here. There's the drone with its things that are allocated to it uh, through, and it has a behavior components to it. So it's, it's essentially a, a live and working diagram uh, that shows the systems of systems view. It's not just some type of cartoon drawing that you're doing with it. Uh, going over to a more detailed view of it, Here's a more detailed view. 
showing the functionality of it. And here's the, the, the you can see that I have the functions that have been brought over into the physical model from it. Now, this is a, it's a fairly simple example, but again, it shows that now I've actually done the system of systems analysis and I've gotten it to the point of where I can actually get to my uh, physical architecture. And I'm gonna go back to my slides at this point. And so the next guideline I have, though, is really comes into this is uh, kind of brings it together is that uh, a system of systems will result in a capella, a set of capella projects, not just one. And this is happening because of the different stakeholders for the constituent systems and components. So this is really and what I'm doing here is I actually have a representation of a, a set of models that I've now developed. So we were just looking at this one right here, this asset recovery model here. Uh, now what I'm going to be doing is I want to basically have another model for the drone or the platform that I'm going to be developing for. And the difference, as I'm stating here, is that these set of Capella projects essentially will have a different set of stakeholders. So in this case here, the, the disaster recovery system may have some humanitarian relief command. That's basically the major stakeholder for it. Here, if, if I had, let's say, a same drone platform being used for a different purpose, it might be on armed services. Uh, in this case here, I have a drone platform. That's the aircraft OEM. And then, of course, the drone platform is decomposed into its own systems, uh, aircraft systems. So an example might be the OEM payload supplier or the OEM airframe. Uh, and then also it could go down to even equipment. So now I'm building this set of models. And this is pretty common when you're doing systems of systems because you really want to focus on what's the functionality that you need at this level here, not the functionality of everything from below. I mean, you don't want to have one big model that has a floor in it up here at this level. First of all, it'd be huge. Uh, you'd have many, many people working in it, uh, which would make it would make a challenge, but also it would never be stable. It would always be changing. You know, you basically doing this hierarchy of models, you can create a lot, a lot more stability. Um, so the reasons why I'm doing this, again, uh, summarizing the, the, the constituent systems, the stakeholders may be different than each system. Um, the systems also may have different life cycles, as we are kind of just saying, you know, if you have a FLIR that's having, that, that's changing because of some component changes, you don't want to be stopping and trying to interact with it when it's located inside of a system of system model. Uh, the other thing is intellectual property. Uh, the, the person who's working at this level here or at the drone level here may have intellectual property. They don't want to expose to everyone else down below. They only want to expose it to the people that need to have essentially the need to know. And likewise, there's intellectual property issues at the lower level of, of the, the problem. The, the person who develops the floor may have technology that they don't want to expose to everybody up here. So we want to be able to do that. Uh, and by separating uh, the information into these different levels, we can actually uh, protect that intellectual property rights. Uh, and also, it, you know, this make, this works well into the d description here of the system of systems, is that when you get to the system of systems, you just naturally have these different actors that are engaged in this. Uh, now, the, the cool thing about Capella is it provides support for this. Uh, if you go back to the SE uh, system engineering book, book of knowledge, let's say from NCOSI, you'll end up finding out there's a te te uh, technique or a, a, an approach called recursion that's talked about for developing systems. And that's essentially, uh, so we are able to get to, let's say, down to a physical architecture, and then you kind of recursively go into the same process again. Well, this is exactly what you can do with Capella by using the system to subsystem transition capability. You can actually go to a certain level of architecture like we did in that system of systems model, and then basically take that information and then start over again in the, basically the developing up of the constituent system. Um, system of system models, and you know, you'll see an example of this, an excellent example in Jim Daly's presentation that he did uh, from 2019 uh, on decomposing a, a high turbo, uh, an ultra fan engine. Uh, so it's an excellent another example of the system to system transition. How this is supported as an add on to Capella, uh, it's built into our Siemens uh, system modeling workbench. Uh, it transitions uh, components, functions, functional chains are all transitioned when you do this. So that's very helpful, as you saw in my system of system example, 
I was using a functional chain to kind of highlight uh, the flow through the model. Well, it actually will transition that functional chain information when you do the system to system transition. Uh, in our latest capability, we actually are with uh, Siemens uh, System Modeling Workbench, we're actually able to even transition out uh, content so that we could carve out a portion of a model and actually take that portion of a model and make it into a, a SysML v2 uh, representation. So I could not only carve out um, a model and basically make it ready to use in Capella, but now that model could be represented in SysML v2, an example being that FLIR. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over and actually show the system of system transition. So I think it's such a, an interesting concept and it's very unique uh, to Capella. Uh, what I'm showing here in my little diagram, I'm actually showing that I'm going to use a system to system transition to go from this level of the model to the drone platform. Uh, whereas other places, I'm actually using the rec replica capability of bringing the, the models together. In this case, I'm going to basically go from the disaster recovery level and I'm going to create content and actually carve it out and push it into an existing model. So I'm not going to even create the drone. I'm just going to assume that the drone model already exists. It's probably very rich, has a lot of content in it. So I'm going to push that content to it. So I'll watch a quick video here. So in this video, you'll see that I actually go and I select the drone model. And then I'm going to invoke a system to subsystem transition vertical, uh, system logical and physical. I'm going to actually go and look for the existing model. I'm going to select that existing model and I'm going to push the content of that, those new functions to that model. Now I'm going to go in and actually take a peek at the model. <clears throat> I'm going to go close this one up, and I'm going to open up the new model with the the one that with the additional new functions. And now I've pushed those functions now into the system level. And what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to go and bring those in. Now, in this example, I actually went and I just looked for the functions and brought them over. Uh, one of the ways I like to do this um, is bring over a few functions and then bring over the functional chains. Uh, because then if I have the functional chain brought over, I can find all the other related functions very readily. Uh, again, this when I was doing this particular example, I wasn't you know leveraging the power that I have of the functional chains. And here I started bringing over the objects. And here's the, the model basically with the, uh, the object brought in, okay? And so it shows that the flow and here's the functional chain and, and brought into that system level. And then it just would continue this down into the, the, the physical space.
Okay, the next guideline I have is Capella projects can use the library, Capella library project to reuse components or constituent systems. Uh, this is a really important when you get to the point where you have content that you want to use. And in this particular example, what I did is I actually take the, the, the payload model here and I carve out a portion of it, or actually develop out a portion of it for the FLIR that actually supports that use case of performing the recon. And so I actually create that, and then I go to the point where I say, well, geez, I have this kind of model, and this is what I, this is what I need, um, and this model could be transferred to the equipment supplier and saying, hey, this is what I need. Uh, in this particular example, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually go and look for uh, a FLIR that meets the need. So I'm actually going to go and look for a library representation that I can then use in a model. Um, I'm going to go and launch a little video that shows this. Here I'm actually in the payload system. I said this is kind of the type of, this is what I need from the floor. I need to capture video. What I'm going to do is I'm going to log in, in this case, into our uh, Siemens product, our uh, uh, through Active Workspace, our Team Center product, and I'm going to go in and search for a floor. I'm going to go in and look for uh, the, the floor that I uh, the, um, and I'm just basically doing a quick search, and this could be set up as a library of different components. I'm going to look for it. I'm going to browse to see if it meets my needs. And I can do that by selecting the object and looking at its diagrams and kind of before I even go and bring it into my environment here of uh, System Modeling Workbench slash Capella. So there's the uh, model that I have. I look at it, I go, yep, that's a lot more detail than what I have decomposed from the top down as I was going through it. Now I'm going to go and basically load that model up in the representation here and start the process of basically populating it. So here it is. I'm going to go do that. I'm going to go ahead and create it as a, there's the floor that's been downloaded. I'm going to create a library dependency on it and then and then essentially start building it into the model. So here I'm going to go and start pulling content in. And then I just start building out the model using the replica, bringing the floor content in, and essentially start populating the content into the model.
Okay. So in this case, I've actually now then gone from this is what my need was, and this is what I'm basically the FLIR that I've brought in and I'm starting to reuse into the model. So going back, I've gone through basically all the steps. So I've gone through the steps of, okay, the project has only one system. So you use that for uh, the system of the system of systems. A project should focus on the stakeholders for the system. Uh, the system may be composed of constituent systems or components. Uh, the functional chains are critical to help you deliver the needs of the stakeholders across the constituent systems. Uh, the system of systems will result in a set of Capella projects due to the different levels and of the stakeholders and the constituent systems and components. The Compel projects can then use the system to subsystem transitions to create sub projects or transfer content to sub projects. And then finally, the Compel project can use the Compel library uh, projects to reuse components to the constituent systems. Now, I mentioned that um, I want to do this also. I'll walk through a quick example of uh, also a, a battery powered hand drill, which is kind of on the weaker side of the spectrum. The difference here is the hand drill doesn't have, as you can even see, it has some various components to the model. But some of them uh, are different. There's different projects, but the stakeholders are overlapping in some cases. Uh, so that's typical of uh, you know a less powerful system of systems. And so I'm going to walk through that example, and I'll go again go through the guidelines. The first one is that the project has only one system. In this case, we're looking at an IoT uh, portable battery charging for this hand drill system. So I would basically have a set of batteries, of course, for my uh, hand drill, and I'm a professional, and I basically want to base charge those hand drills up. Uh, so this is my this is my portable battery charging system here. I've got a professional, uh, and I have a professional with a remote app. I have a warehouse that I have. I want to ship batteries from. So this is my system of my system of systems. My actors here in this one are my are those professionals with the remote app and the and physical access to the charger and the warehouse. In my design, this is the kind of the design of what it's going to look like with the uh, going over into the physical mode. I've got the charger itself. Uh, I've got a an, an Apple product app that that basically is going to be used to help the professional know when batteries are charges or when batteries are dying. I've got a cloud server here. I've got some, you know, I have cellular network that's communicating through Wi-Fi when it's available for the charger. Um, and then I have the basically the battery packs themselves. Now, the battery packs in this case are reusable components. So those are basically coming from uh, the 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 uh, that is in common with the charger with the hand drill itself. Again, I'm going to use the the functional chains. So I'm going to basically go through the whole system with a set of functional chains. It's going to start with basically I want to be able to charge the battery. And here's my operational analysis view of that. And then I go into more of the operational analysis activity size, and I have the charge operation. And you can see the professional is interacting with the charger and the battery and the warehouse to ship the batteries. So there's different use cases that are uh, used here in this part of the model. Uh, next, uh, the portable IoT battery charging system is the system analysis view. So it kind of shows what's in the system versus what's out of this, essentially a system of systems. Okay, and again, my timing looks good. So I'm going to jump over and we're going to look at one of this example in a little bit more detail. So here's my hand drill example. So we'll jump in at that system analysis view. So here's my system analysis view of it. You can see that again, I have all my functional chains over here of all the different things the battery charger needs to do. I'm going to go take a look at the logical architecture of it. Here's my logical view. And here I'm focused in mainly on just the charge flow. So I show that I have, um, I want to monitor the, the state of charging. The professional wants to be able to do that. Uh, I'm providing power, 110 power. Uh, the professional with remote app, I so I want to provide the health of the battery charge, the state of the battery charge. Uh, in this case, I also want to accept orders and provide the option to order going on. That's from another functional chain. Uh, the cloud application itself is doing things like lo locating battery replacements, communicating the status. Um, the charger itself is, going to determine the life expectancy of the battery, maybe compute the percent of charge, 
the charge of the battery. So, you know, as a professional, you'd want to know, well, is my battery going to die at some point? Is it, am I near uh, the point where I need to reorder some, knowing that I may use two or three packs a day? That's kind of what this idea of here, of what you're trying to do with this capability. Take a look at the logical architecture of that. And now, the, now we're going to go to the physical. Now, I'd like to always do a nice high level view that kind of like this cartoon view. Uh, and I always do that. So I just kind of show the physical chargers, the cloud and the server. And then I like to do a, a deeper dive kind of showing the uh, behavior view. So this is a behavior view with the functions mapped to it. So it kind of shows all the different pieces. And now this is really, you know, you know, and now, another reason why I would do this is then at some point I might not go and have this app developed. And if I'm an IOT manufacturer, or a, a company that builds battery chargers, I may not know how to do the app. So this is an example of where this app now is something that I may want to do a functional to uh, a, a, a system to subsystem transition to basically send this app to a supplier to basically build out um, the uh, the app for the hand drill. And in this case, I actually uh, have that done here. So I already did went through that activity of doing the sub system to subsystem transition. Open that up, take a look at it. And this is what the functionality of the app. So again, I'm able to start doing the process of building the, the app out uh, with the cloud server and the professional remote apps. These are now the, 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 act, the activities that are outside of it. And if I go and look at the two of them kind of keep together here, You can see that I'm basically now the professional is here, so you still have that. Uh, you have on this side the cloud server that's talking to, and there's the battery app that's now being developed. Now you, you can tell that this is again where I'm working with a supplier. Uh, I don't need to tell my supplier everything I need uh, that they need to. They don't need to see my whole model. They just need to know what they need to build for me. And so this is a perfect for doing that type of scenario and uh, using this functionality of system to subsystem transitions. Okay. Now I'm going to go back to my slide deck again. And we went through all these. So, and then finally we get to the point where, you know, you are going to have these multiple layers and you kind of just showed, I just showed an example of that, of where I basically had the battery charger app that basically was spun out of the, the system of system model. So I have this network of products. Uh, you also saw that I had the battery pack, which was actually a reusable component that's being used in the intelligent charger, but also being used in the hand drill itself. You can use the, you saw I me mean, use the system, I use the system of system uh, transition to basically go from the intelligent connected battery charger down to the battery charger app. And then over here, I use the library project to basically take the battery pack and insert, insert, insert it into the intelligent connected battery charger and into the hand drill itself. Okay, so then just kind of a summary then, you know, you saw that, you know, basically the project has only one system. And so I focused on using the system analysis system for that one system. Uh, a project should focus on the stakeholders for that system. And so you actually start uh, only worry about the stakeholders for the, the big system that you're working on. Don't get wrapped around the axle trying to worry about the needs for a battery uh, when you're trying to do that whole level system analysis view. Uh, a system may be composed of these constituent systems or components. You saw the components being used when I was using the, uh, the battery charger example. You saw here the, the functional chains are still incredibly important. Uh, they deliver the functionality across the level that you're working on. Uh, and the functional chains can be leveraged to uh, at the net lower level because the functional chains do get transferred with the system to subsystem transition. So they're very important to help you know that uh, in grouping together the functionality that you're handing off to the lower level system. Uh, the system of system will always will typically result in a set of Capella projects because of these different stakeholders that you're worried about. Uh, the Capella projects can use the system of system, system transition to create the sub projects or pass data to sub projects, and and the Capella projects can use the Capella library project for that reusable components. And so you end up with a whole a need a set of needs. Um, 
And, you know, I know many of you may know that I have a nice uh, innovating Capella uh, website um, tra uh, training site that I use to help the Capella community. One of the things to take a, to keep an eye open for is at some point I am going to be doing an example using a, the Helium network. Uh, I do enjoy my hobbies, and then one of my hobbies right now is setting up uh, a helium network uh, using uh, sensors. So I do have a nice little sensor here that I'm getting ready to use. So I have a nice example around a temperature probe, and I'm using that. So I'll be adding that to my uh, my uh, presentations because, again, <laughs> interesting enough, the students that I worked with two years ago on their prize winning. Uh, competition, they used LoRa uh, as the technology for communicating their between their devices. And now it's just taken off like crazy, uh, especially with the introduction of the Helium uh, network solution. And so I'll be use that and please stay tuned. Um, I'm about to wrap up. Uh, one final thing I want to do is I want to thank the Capella community. And one of the reasons why I'm engaged in giving this presentation is I'm building uh, my content on the shoulders of giants. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Talos community, Stefan Bonet, uh, Juan Navez, Jean-Luc, uh, did an excellent job. Uh, their textbooks, uh, Jean-Luc's textbook was one of my favorites. Uh, I'd like to thank the OBO community, uh, Etienne and Stefan, who helped mentor me early when I was learning this product. I'd like to thank Pascal Rogues for writing an incredible textbook, uh, who helped uh, me get through the first phases. And again, people like Jim Daly uh, for their contribution uh, to the Capella community in, in presenting these webinars. Uh, I want to thank all of them, and I hope that I can continue uh, building out this community and basically making system engineering, especially system modeling, accessible to a much more wider audience than we've ever had before. So, okay. so I'm basically going to turn it back to Laurent uh, for questions. Absolutely. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation. Uh, it was re really great, I thought so. I believe there are a number of questions and a lot of interest, uh, especially regarding the life cycle of your models when you transition from the system of system model to the subsystems. The first question was, how do you manage the cardinality of some subsystems? A question about, OK, you may have one or two or several drones, and particularly uh, when this cardinality has an effect, only one drone might arise uh, some vulnerability, for example. So uh, do you manage the cardinality and how? Well, you do use the, the, the rec and replica capability for, for that capability. So I will have, you know, so for instance, if I had multiple sensors or multiple drones, I could have multiple replicas in the higher level model. Uh, so I would get the, the cardinality from that, that direction. Um, the and and then they could differ in capabilities uh you know eventually if you wanted to go that route but that's that's how i basically have done it in the past that i'll i'll just keep using that thing i think there's some and needs some areas of enhancement there especially when kind of let's say you do have kind of existing systems maybe stitching together some of those uh lower level components uh and uh you know i'm very excited about what i'm seeing with the uh the python capabilities that came out in the last presentation uh, webinar we had because i think uh again using python to help you do some of the ex activities of stitching together uh components to help you with that cardinality will be huge because <laughs> it does take a little bit of time putting together these systems okay thank you uh a few questions about the life cycle one of them so the first one about life cycle is that can Capella manage the multiple life cycles of each of the system and subsystems and the interaction of these life cycles? I, I believe that's the point of the system subsystem transition. Yeah, and that's really the, the idea of, of, of splitting the models up is because I've split the models. Uh, so I have the model of the battery, for instance, in the Internet of Things example. That battery is going to evolve at a different life cycle than, let's say, the hand drill or the charger. Uh, and basically, by having them as separate models and managed as separate models, the models can have a different life cycle, a different uh, introduction of capabilities. You know, you're going to find with you know with the lower level things like a battery, technology may change. So you, you know, you may be changing things inside of that device that's at a completely different life cycle than what the battery charger is at, for instance. And so that's one of the benefits of splitting the two is that you now have them independent. Uh, and and also another you know side benefit is that you don't have to have as many system engineers in one model <laughs> by splitting the models up like that with different levels. Uh, you can have the system of system model maybe only managed by 
you know, 20, 30, you know, maybe five or 10 people doing the system of system model. But then you may get down to that, you know, in the other example of the aircraft, that aircraft model may have 20 people working in that one. You know, it might be many more. Uh, I, and what I actually saw with some of the system of systems is that I, I don't need to have everything that's going on below me up in it. I just need to be pushing down the functionality that I need to support it. So if you're doing disaster recovery example and you want to scan for people, uh, that are buried, it's a totally different set of use cases than if you're going out and targeting, uh, you know, IEDs along a roadside. So, you know, it's, there's no, you know, I don't need to know everything that the aircraft does uh, at that system of system model to create a good level uh, implementation. And again, that those two things would evolve at different life cycles um, and could go through different changes. And again, functional change based on uh, the work of that we've seen from Yuan and uh, Jean-Luc you know, the functional chains at the different levels will be evolving. So you'll have things happening at that system of system level that's generating, you know, needs for the the aircraft or the different aircrafts evolving at a different speed than the aircraft itself, which again might be evolving because of technology changes and things that you want to do with it. Uh, so it's not it's great at separating the two models from that reason. It does it add complexity, yes. And you saw I'd be using an example of a of I actually was using a Capella model to represent that hierarchy, uh, and uh, it, it's, it might be a little bit of a reach, but you know, think of the model as a behavior component, and uh, and that's what I was representing it as, and I was showing the interfaces between the models as the system to system transition and the rec and app replica. Um, but uh, that was helpful for me to keep the, the mental model in mind of what the network of models were and how I'm pushing content between the two. Okay. So I think that's also probably answering some of the next questions, but I'll ask them anyway. There are two questions by Bob Shelton. Is the PA of the system of system designed before the transition to a subsystem, or will it be filled afterwards due to the PA design of its subsystems? Well, that's that's an excellent question. And I think, again, with constituent systems, they may pre-exist what you're building. Uh, so the physical arch there's no shame in going and doing the physical architecture, and that's probably the biggest mental switch that you have to do is that it's okay to go off and do the logical and physical architecture uh, before you may have your system analysis completed, because the fact these constituent systems exist, uh, their interfaces exist. You know, their uh, GPS, for instance, might be a constituent system that you're you want to throw into your model. Um, it already exists. It's already there. The ways that you work with it are already there. Again, kind of with the cloud examples that I had with the Internet of Things, those interfaces that you know, that you're going to choose to use. Let's say if whether it's a uh, some type of uh, gateway that you're going to you know you're going to develop your solution on, they already exist. So you, yeah, you basically let yourself go ahead and model those things, realizing that you don't have to model them to a hundred percent. Uh, because again, you want to flow your system of systems content down. So you're really focused on, okay, I'm going to, you know, think of them almost as constraints. You know, I'm going to model the physical architecture. I'm going to model what the interfaces are that I have available to me to, for my physical architecture. Um, you know, and let's say an example would be, uh, you know, autonomous vehicle. Uh, how I'm going to communicate that autonomous, autonomous vehicle, the, the technology already exists of how I'm going to communicate to it. Either I'm going to use 5G, or I'm going to use some type of cellular communication, or I'm going to use some type of satellite communication. That technology is kind of given, so it's okay to go ahead and model that physical architecture early. Okay, and then the next question, very logically, is how are the subprojects synchronized when the system of system evolves? Probably a question by somebody who's not very familiar with the system to subsystem transition. And maybe yeah, I think the, the system to subsystem transition, you know is one aspect of it that's the flow down and so basically you would synchronize by driving the change uh, that you're doing from the higher level model to the lower level model and essentially pushing the content in you would open up the low level model for a change you would basically push the lower the content from the upper into the lower and you would get the content now in the lower level model and it would all be done in the sense of oh i'm absorbing the change coming from the the system of system model. Uh, the rep and from bottom up, let's say the library concepts, you have uh, the powerful concepts of rec and replicas. Uh, I, I like this concept a lot because it puts the burden on the, let's say the battery. I can basically define the components that I'm going to reuse. And I also can define 
the visibility of what I want to reuse. You know, if, if the person, the reuse, the person above me only needs to know the interfaces that I'm working with, I don't have to expose possibly my, my intellectual property of, of how the battery works. I can just expose what they need to know. And so that's, so they would basically say, okay, here, I'm going to basically create for reuse this, uh, uh, replica element. That's what the rec term is. And then, then you basically give that model to them, uh, for them to basically uh, use, you know, by exposing the rec content, uh, and they may not necessarily have to have the ability to see all the details of, uh, the full model, and then the upper level model then chooses when to use it. So it, it actually happens at two point. They can choose to update their model with the new content, or or basically stay at the old content. So you're putting control on the consumer also. Uh, so that's a very helpful uh, approach also because they may not want to have the latest update from the battery uh, until they're ready to to model and incorporate that into their model of the system. So you could essentially have like a version one of the battery, then a version two of the battery that has its new updated uh, component for reuse. Okay, thank you. I, I see more questions, so I'm just trying to prioritize them so because <laughs> I may not have the time to answer all of them, even though they are interesting. So just give me a second. Uh, Oh, there was a quick question, I believe, about how do you generate the library packages, but I think you've just answered that actually you, you model these library packages, yep. or teams model them, and they are given to you when you need to, to work on your system of system or your component or subsystem, and you reuse what's in the libraries. If you want to add a few words maybe here. Yeah, that's, that is right. You, you essentially are modeling them um, in... Uh, you model them as essentially just like you do Capella, but, you know, libraries are essentially the similar to it. Now, what's actually interesting at this point that's happening and we're introducing capabilities is that we can also uh, consume uh, models from, you know, using system LV2, we're actually going to be able to use that capability to get components from uh, other tools that can produce a system LV2 representation. And that becomes kind of that record. Uh, re re uh, they call it, we call it a rec, it's a nickname, but it's a recordable element. That becomes the part that you're going to reuse in the higher level model, uh, but it is, uh, you know, it's 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 actually you know you have to think a little bit ahead of time. You know what typically happens a lot of times is I'll start from uh, doing a, uh, a system to subsystem transition to create a model, uh, and then I'll take that subsystem trans system to subsystem transition to model and turn that into a library and detailing it out and then inserting it back into the upper level model. That's a pretty typical way. Uh, there's always a, there's a little trick of converting from uh, from Capella projects to Capella libraries. Um, we uh, we can share that with you. We actually recently uh, even used that with. Uh, 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 we've added some scripts that we can use with Python scripting to help do that conversion for people. If you don't want to get in there and modify uh, the XML file. <laughs> Okay, and by the way, there was a question about uh, how you may go between Capella and SysMLv2 since you mentioned it. So, if you uh, can this, also add a few words there. Yeah, we have a new functionality coming out in uh, this month. Uh, the releases actually should be any day now, uh, and uh, we'll be able to demonstrate that capability. Um, I still haven't had my hands on it, but I'm looking forward to it. Uh, it does leverage the the rec replica concept. So essentially, you would have the SysMLv2 model. Uh, you know, would be uh, used as a reusable component. Uh, and hopefully, that'll be some, a nice future topic to add to a, a webinar. <laughs> Very excited about that. Yeah, so am I. Okay, have you used this approach? So I believe the, the uh, system and the subsystem approach uh, to interact with non-system models, like a logistics model or fraction models or other kinds of models. Just yeah, I, I absolutely think it could work um, for doing that. Uh, again, it, you'd have, it's def what you define the system as. I mean, is the logistics uh, part of your problem part of that? Maybe it becomes it turns into a system of systems model uh, at a different level. But you know, you you consider logistics as part of the system of systems, and I think that's what's going to you're going to see more people doing that. I mean, I look at. Uh, Companies like uh, Natalis, uh, I think I'm pronouncing the name right, but it's a new aerospace company that's redesigning an entire aircraft just for uh, logistics purposes. And, and the way they're designing that aircraft, I would assume that the 
the entire the business model for it is much bigger than just the aircraft. I mean, if it's a logistic it's an aircraft just made for logistics, um, that's going to be part of the the whole overall view of of how to uh, incorporate the content into it. Um, but yeah, you know, that's really why I think there's a huge opportunity for Capella, especially if even other languages or other modeling tools may be used uh, for system modeling. I think there's an opportunity for Capella to be used at this higher level of system of system modeling. Uh, and I think with some new things uh, coming along with uh, with the system LV2 support, I think that it'll be easier for people to do that. Okay. Uh, there is a question about the scale of successful integration. I, I believe the question is, I, I read it to you. What is the scale of successful integration you have demonstrated for the system of systems as relates to architecture integration, all subsystems, functions, requirement, and systems of system transitions and libraries? Will Team Center or SMW or Capella enable this uh, system of system framework for thousands of objects and will workability suffer beyond a certain level of complexity? Um, it, it will definitely enable it. And I think that's the one of the things that you know we're trying to do with Siemens is to help the scalability problem. Uh, because yeah, just trying to manage a couple models and even managing, like for instance, right now, if we have a model with libraries in it, when we in, we include a model, at least I mean, in my example, include a model uh, of the FLIR. If that FLIR had other components that were uh, part, that were being used, other libraries being used to build it, that would have been loaded also at the same time. So you would have gotten all the content at once. So those are the things we are really trying to worry about uh, worry about with our solution is to make it scalable. Um, you know, and I think there's there's more more to be done, but like, for example, this network of models, there's nothing preventing me from pushing that network of models into uh, a, a tool set such as Team Center. I could push that content in and I can start linking up models so that I can find other models from models. Uh, so I think there's a, you know, there's some enhancements we can do around that type of uh, capability, but there's a lot of functionality right there right now that we can take, that we can leverage. Uh, the area of system to subsystem transition, I think is an, an area that will continue to improve so that you can repeat the process easier of doing the system to subsystem transitions. Uh, but right now it's a fairly, you know, it's fairly straightforward how to do it now. You just have to know what models you want to push content to. Uh, but I think if you're going to do something on a regular basis, uh, maybe we could figure out ways to persist that relationship so that you always, you can just repeat the process of moving content backwards and forwards, backwards, you know, down, downward, essentially. Okay. Um, do you use requirements viewpoints? And more precisely, can requirements traceability links be transitioned from the parent system to uh, uh, to subsystems or to logical and physical transitions? Uh, I believe the question would be rather from a system to the subsystems. Uh, at this point, I'm I'm not too sure what the latest release is doing as far as the requirements content being uh, transferred down. I don't think that would be very difficult to do. Uh, Again, it would be unique to, um, this is one of the differences between Capella and System Modeling Workbench. We do include uh, a requirements viewpoint in uh, System Modeling Workbench. We do include system to subsystem transitions. So we do have that, that capability to add that behavior to it. Uh, whether it was in the, is in the rate latest 6.0 release that's coming out, I don't know. Uh, but again, we're, you're, you're, it's a difference between Capella, and this presentation today was mainly about Capella, uh, uh, because Capella doesn't include system to subsystem transition in it. Uh, it that, that functionality wouldn't be there. I don't I wouldn't expect that to be built into it that would move the requirements viewpoints across. Uh, but it, we, we can get more clarification on that. Okay, so more on that later. Uh, okay, I believe we are almost done with the questions. So. Uh, there is a question by Matt Works about what are the model analysis capabilities and do you use them? Uh, there's, you know, there's a capability we, we have, actually we rely a lot on partner capabilities for doing model analysis. I mean, we do model validation and checking. This is a more of a basic question of Capella. Uh, Capella does do checking to make sure the, the models are uh, made to have relationships that need to be there from the higher level system analysis models to the lower level logical models. Uh, there's lots of things built into Capella to do that. Uh, but Capella isn't uh, doesn't have an execution engine in it to actually execute the models. And so uh, there are a couple 
uh, Siemens has partners that we're developing to do the model execution. Uh, and uh, you can find some of those on uh, our websites. Um, and uh, we also, in the Capella community itself, uh, you'll see pre presentations on people that are building integrations to it. I think some of those may actually be on the, the Capella website of integrations that support. Uh, I think there's a presentation from DES uh, PGM that's out there that shows an integration to basically the state machine capabilities. And uh, right now we support uh, integrations to uh, 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 Simulink uh, using some of that capability. Uh, but we're always we're looking at improving that. One of the things that you know Siemens is always about open and and trying to build that relationship. We think a lot of potential. We also see a lot of potential of System LV2 helping with that uh, integration capability. In the, and the we'll, and you'll be hearing more about that in the next couple of years. Okay, I think we can take one more minute for a last question, and we'll be done. Uh, so. Are you aware of the US digital engineering initiatives? And do you know if in that frame uh, there has been some investigation about the system of systems modeling with Capella? I am I do not know if uh, the digital I don't know if there's a you know that particular entity that you're digital engineering. I mean ourselves we are trying to push that as much as possible, you know, with introducing you know basically Capella being used for a system of systems. I don't know of a initiative through an organization. Uh, that was mentioned. The there. question was more specifically about the Stevens Institute of Technology. I don't know if you are. Uh, Stevens Institute of Technology. Uh, we're we haven't reached out to that organization yet. Uh, we've reached out to other organizations and we started to introduce uh, Capella. We found that in the U.S., Capella is lagging a little bit behind Europe as far as acceptance. You know, in the Arcadia methodology, uh, we also see with like Stevens Institute has been a leader for many years at using System LV1. Uh, and and so some of the things that I've seen, you know, seeing System LV1, especially stuff that has come out of the the the, uh, the, the System Engineering Research Center uh, that Stevens is part of, a lot of it is around uh, System LV1 and the capabilities of it. But I think some of the power that you're seeing, especially the system of subsystem transition, that's leveraging the, the the capabilities of Arcadia's rich meta model, and that rich meta model allows you to do these system to subsystem transitions that you can't do. Uh, with system LV1. And so we're we're kind of at a, a turning point where people want to um, you know embrace a, a rich meta model. You see system LV2 about to be ready to be released. It's going to have that rich meta model. Uh, but uh, system LV1 itself, the diagrams, uh, and there was no consistency of what the meta model was going to look like. Uh, and uh, I appreciate the whole um, the Talos team and, and the OBO team for for basically bringing uh, Capella uh, to light with a rich model. And because of that, we can leverage it for things like you that you're seeing today in my demonstration. You can do system to subsystem transition. You can do uh, reuse of components. And it's that rich model that's allowing that to happen. And I think now with system LV2 coming on board, uh, we're going to see uh, a movement towards that in general. And I think that will help us a lot, you know, going to these communities that may have not embraced the multiple level models concepts before because it really wasn't feasible uh, with system LV1 in the same way. So. Okay, so uh, this webinar is now over. Just bear with me a few more minutes to, for a quick shout out. We'll have the next webinar on March the 15th, uh, so in uh, one small month, and it will be the Capella annual message by Juan Navas. So if you want to know all that's new in Capella, uh, latest version, and what's coming in the next versions of Capella, that's really the, the webinar that you shouldn't miss. So be there or be square. And also uh, a few words on the next uh, training that we will be giving. Don't miss the opportunity to learn from the Capella experts. Uh, there will be a training on March from the 21 to the 28th of March. Uh, an online training program in English through six courses of uh, three and a half hours uh, from one Monday to the next. Uh, so if you are interested, reach out to us at sales at obiosoft.ca. The information is there. So please take a screenshot if you are interested. And with that, thank you very much, uh, Tony, for this uh, great presentation about systems of, uh, of systems. And thank you, everybody, for your attention. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Thank you.